So Greg, thanks again for joining us. Uh, first off, what exactly does a hydrologist do? The hydrologist, we have a jack of all trades when it comes to backgrounds, engineers, hydrology, watershed management, meteorologists. The primary concept is once the rain hits the ground, what happens to it? How much soaks in, how much runs off, the timing of the runoff, and then we try to guess the height of the river systems across the state of Texas from the Sabine River to the Rio Grande inclusive heights so that you can make decisions uh, to save lives and protect property. Awesome. So you, at your office there at the National Weather Service, you got hydrologists and meteorologists. How do those sciences tie together and how do y'all work together to uh, forecast this stuff? There's a lot of overlap if you think about meteorology. You know, we focus on a lot of things, but we focus on precipitation. The hydrologists do the same thing. Uh, there's a cross train. The science, you know, can can lend itself to cross training. However, when we get into the large events, we will move our river forecasters and hydrologists to hydrology. We'll move our meteorologists to meteorology and put their experts on their expertise. So when you you're talking about once the water hits the ground, and you know, mainly talking rivers, what what kind of forecasting or can you do to for when it comes to the rising waters with the rivers in our area? The easiest way to is to break it down into, into mathematics and volume. We try to estimate rainfall using radar, gauge, satellite, and then human data quality control to create a volume of water of rain that falls. Then what percentage of that volume soaks into the ground and what percentage runs off. So we now have a volume calculation of runoff. We then try to estimate timing, uh, runoff response, and, and routing responses. Uh, and we rely on federal partners to give us data so that we can figure out a volume and flow into a height measurement so that you know river at 28 feet. Oh, I know at 28 feet I need to start taking action. So there's a lot of math, a lot of science, but just think of it as there's a volume of water coming down, how much of it's going to hit the ground and run in, how much is going to run off, and then the timing of draining it downstream. So I know in meteorology we use models for a lot of stuff. How much modeling do you all do with all the math and science to try to figure out how these rivers are going to rise and how the water is going to affect everything? A lot of models. Uh, we use one primarily uh, that's a, a mathematical, it's a hydrologic model. But we, with computing technology increasing, we have multiple model sets now that we can use. Uh, we can use more physics and dynamics-based models. It's like, give us a, a scientist, give us data, we love it. Uh, we use one operational, but we'll look at others to help us fine tune our forecast. So when we talk about river flooding, which is a lot what y'all do, for, for the viewer out there, what's the difference between more flash flooding and the river flooding that y'all are trying to forecast for? It's an area that overlaps. The easiest way is that if it is associated with the river rising, that is river flooding. Heavy rain can produce flash flooding, uh, can overwhelm storm drainage, and can produce aerial flooding. That is a short term. Eventually it makes its way to the river and then the river starts rising. So the weather forecast offices across the, uh, the nation, including the National Weather Service here in Fort Worth, they will issue flash flood warnings and those type of products to cover the short term and the aerial. But once it gets to a river system, we call it riverine flooding, uh, then it falls, uh, the calculations fall under the River Forecast Center and we provide guidance so that our weather offices can issue more products that are more fine tuned and detailed to help people make decisions. So you were talking about a volume of water coming down. How hard is it for you when you know, you're talking about soil, how moist it is, but also the, the urban impact of that, of you know, concrete and all that, of how, how much does that affect runoff as it gets to the rivers and the flooding concerns? A tremendous impact because if you take an open field and put a subdivision with a strip mall, you've now increased the impervious area of rooftops and concrete and made it run off a lot faster. So we are constantly having to recalibrate our models because we, we try to simulate land use. And if something changes, then we've got to go back and calibrate it, recalibrate it in house. So right off the bat, we know more runoff and faster runoff uh, to, to then put those calculations into our river model to try to predict river levels. So we've got a lot of major rivers that run through the state of Texas. Explain how big of an area y'all are monitoring and forecasting for with these river basins. Uh, our forecast area of responsibility, I call ourselves the Texas River Forecast Center, but we, we don't handle the sulfur, the red, or the Canadian. We are the Sabine River on the Texas-Louisiana border over to the Rio Grande 
and we are the responsible agency for the Rio Grande flooding. So that is a, a multinational you know, aspect there. It is over 400,000 square miles. And if you think about you know, the, the large area, you know, every lake that's been built, and think about that for a minute, that Texas only has one natural lake and it's not in the river forecast centers area, it's up in, in Northeast Texas. Each lake that has to be built, you know, need to know why it was built, who owns and operates it and the owners so that you can coordinate releases. So it's a, it's a large area of footprint. Uh, and then there's a lot of, of moving parts and moving pieces of people you need to coordinate with. Yeah, that, that, that's gotta be, yeah, there's a coordination of this gotta be amazing uh, with it. So, you know, we, we're talking with you on flooding and a lot of people are like, hey, we're in a big bad drought, but uh, how, how does this drought affect y'all's forecast when you start talking about uh, the potential of flooding when we do get a big rain event? Normally, you know, we would joke that if it ain't flooding, we ain't working. That's not the case. Uh, we are always doing model calibration, flood inundation mapping calibration. We're doing extra work. So when it stops flooding, we're still very busy. But during a drought, it goes into another one in that, that water deliveries. We assist the river authorities and other water, you know, water agencies to help them make decisions on their releases so they can meet their contracts. So we have weekly coordination calls with the large operators across the state to help provide them guidance so that they know what to make on low water deliveries. And it's almost as critical as it is when there's high water and flooding going on. So you cover a large area. Is there certain rivers or portions of the rivers across y'all's forecast area that y'all really get more worried about that become more flood prone or can affect more people? That's a good question and it's kind of double-sided. As you go from east to west, you go from a literal swamp in the Sabine River area to the literal desert in El Paso on the Rio Grande. We get more rain out east, so we focus on the rainfall aspects there. But really, it's the impacts. Uh, we're really concerned with the metropolitan areas, Dallas-Fort Worth, all the entire I-35 corridor down to Austin and San Antonio, especially with the buildup that's occurring in that area. And then the coastal areas, Houston, Corpus, and Brownsville, the metropolitan areas there. So you could say the Trinity River is important, the Brazos River is important, you know, the Guadalupe, San Antonio, San Jacinto. But in actuality, all rivers are important because as Mother Nature just taught us, a heavy rain event can occur anywhere in the state of Texas. And you better be ready because there's a different vulnerability with each river system. We may look towards the population areas a little bit more, but it is critically important to make sure we stay situationally aware of the, our entire 400,000 square mile area. Wow, 400,000 square miles, that is a lot to cover. So it, off the top of your head, what, what were some of the big events, of uh, flooding events that y'all have had to, to cover that's taken a lot of work in your office? In, in my two decades here at the uh, River Forecast Center, uh, the big one that everyone is gonna lock into is Harvey uh, in the Houston area. Uh, unprecedented impacts hitting a vulnerable, a very vulnerable population. If it wasn't for Har Harvey, you know, Imelda, the following year uh, would have been the talk of the storm that everyone was talking about from that extreme rain event. But the 2015 event to where almost the entire state of Texas had a heavy rain event every day for a month, uh, the large scale events, uh, Memorial Day floods of 16, uh, the Austin floods that were around Halloween, uh, you know, th th there's so many of them. And uh, one thing to point out, you know, Hurricane Alex in 2010 was Harvey before Harvey. I mean, it, it was a large category three hurricane that moved inland, sat and dropped rainfall that that area had never seen before and produced flooding all on the, all on the Rio Grande. So there are so many, 2007 large events, 2002. So it, unfortunately, I've got a, a lot of significant flooding events under my belt. Wow, that, yeah, I remember the 2016, I was actually out chasing the storms and having to avoid some of that high water while we were out and, uh, and remember the rivers coming up, but it is crazy to think that we could see that and then still be extremely dry and hot like this. Um, what I, I can tell just by talking to you, you're, you're extremely interested and uh, passionate about this. What got you directed into the science of hydrology? It uh, started with a passion of meteorology. Uh, 13 year old on the north side of Houston when Hurricane Alicia hit in 1983. And I wanna know what is this power, what's going on? And I went to get my meteorology degree from Texas A&M University. Uh, but once I joined the National Weather Service, I noticed that, that flooding kills more on average. Uh, you know, on any four years, three years, there'll be flooding will be more than tornado. Uh, tornadoes get a lot of, of, of publicity, but I wanted, my passion was trying to figure out the flooding, especially Texas flooding. 
And when it jumped over into the river forecast in our world in 2000, it started zoning in on just the, the volumes of water that mother nature can produce around here. And, um, you know, I joke that father time is undefeated and I also joke that mother nature is undefeated. There's always something to learn. And you were talking about the number of deaths from flooding. What kind of advice would you give people when it comes to flood safety and preparedness and what to do when we go through something like that? The first one, don't underestimate the power of water. I know this sounds kind of vague, but most of our stats show that we could probably eliminate half of our flood related fatalities if we could keep people from driving through flooded roadways. Um, but you know, water's got a lot of hef heaviness to it. And when it's moving, it's got a lot of force to it. Um, and you may think that you've got a big vehicle and then can drive around it. But what I tell everyone, it doesn't matter how big your vehicle is. You know, the Titanic was a big vehicle. It floated and eventually it sank. And when you drive a vehicle into a flooded roadway and you lose contact and you start floating, you don't have a rudder, you don't have an engine and you're at the mercy of, of the water. And if we could just get that, there was go there's probably half of our flood related fatalities. The rest is if you know your flood risk and you hear a flood warning, the weather service determined that's a, a life threatening situation. Take the appropriate action and the appropriate action is get to higher ground. So one thing that I always get questions on people was, you know, we'll have a, a big heavy rain event, you'll have your flash floods and stuff like that, but then the river flood warnings will last a lot longer. Uh, explain how the, the runoff and the effects that has on the rivers as they could keep rising after an event. The best way for me to explain it would be, you get rain locally in the Waco area, or you get rain locally and say in Hillsborough and it drains out, if there was a rain event upstream, that water's got to make its way through the system and come to you as well. So river flooding can be more long-term, A, because it may take the river longer to respond, but B, there may be a flood event upstream. Do you know what's going on with the weather and the hydrology upstream that may cause that? Uh, a classic example of the Trinity River, when we have rainfall in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, it could take up to seven days to get down into the Lake Livingston area and then another seven days to get down uh, to, the, to the mouth in Galveston Bay local flash flooding it rained hard on you or near you it's a quick moving system but river flooding there's a lot that can go on especially well upstream uh, that could cause river flooding to hang around for days if not weeks so you said you've been two decades of doing it uh, how much changes in the quality of forecast or uh, have you seen or just in the technicality of the forecast with all the urbanization going on in the last two decades from a weather forecast standpoint, uh, when I first joined, we did a three day forecast from the National Weather Service and like a day four, day five outlook. And now we do a seven day forecast and the accuracy, of, you know, in that time frame, we're probably more accurate now at seven days than we were three days back, you know, in the mid nineties. Uh, one thing that I, that I do know is that, you know, our ability to forecast the exact rainfall amount and timing, it's called the quantitative precipitation forecast. It's not a 30% chance of rain or scattered showers. It is saying it, the storms will develop here and produce this much rainfall in this time frame. And when I first joined, our, our weather models in Texas, zero to six hours of lead time. I mean, it really wasn't a lot. We can see a storm system coming in now and we get an idea that there's gonna be a rain event, but we can expand that to 24 hours. The high resolution meteorological models have done a really good job of, of expanding the accuracy of that forecast. You give me a better rainfall forecast and my river forecasters will definitely give you a better river forecast. And we are, you know, smaller time scale, uh, more resolution because we have computing technology that allows us to go from a daily time step to a six hours time step. So in some cases we have a one hour time step on our river models to try to catch those peaks. And that's computing technology and science. Keep pushing, keep pushing. That's awesome. So wh where can people find this, your, your stuff from your office, the, if they wanted to find the data when events are happening like this? The quickest place would be weather.gov slash FWR, Frank Whiskey Romeo. Uh, that would be the River Forecast Center page. The National Weather Service River Forecast Centers and Weather Forecast Offices have their own pages. If you go, you'll see a map of Texas with all sorts of colored points and you can zoom in. And when you do, you can see data and we rely heavily with our partners at the US Geologic Survey uh, to get us river data across the area. Our partners like Lower Colorado River Authority, Brazos River Authority uh, to get us data. And when forecasts are issued, you'll see what pops up as a hydrograph of past 
uh, river observations. And if there's a line in the future, that would be our forecasters trying to predict the volume of water going downstream. Awesome. Well, Greg, I really appreciate it. I, you know, being a meteorologist, I, I, we work, like I said, hand in hand with y'all. And But I don't think a lot of people know that side of the science after it, the rain hits the ground and how much work that takes to keep people safe. But we appreciate all you do and taking some time to sit down and talk with us. I appreciate it anytime.